On the morning of August 21st, 2013, Assad and the Syrian regime bombed the suburb of Ghouta in the countryside of Damascus with a deadly chemical nerve agent, sarin. More than 1,300 civilians, mostly women and children, were murdered instantly. For today's podcast, I will be meeting with Ali Zawawi, a survivor of the chemical weapons attack. We will also be discussing what it was like living under besiegement for seven years and how one event changed his life forever. Join us on the Levant 24 podcast to hear more. To my brothers, sisters and guests around the world, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm your host Khaled coming to you from Idlib, Syria. My guest today is a graduate from Damascus University. He was besieged by the Syrian regime for seven years and is a survivor of the 2013 chemical attacks on Ghouta. He's an English teacher by day and a revolutionist by night. His name is Ali Zawawi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for the, for the very nice introduction. You're welcome. It's very nice to see you today, brother. Barakallah, very nice to see you. It's my pleasure. So before we dive into the topic of chemical weapons, I'm interested to hear more about your life and in particular how your life was before the revolution started. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, before the revolution started, I was uh, a teacher, English teacher, and I was continuing my studies at University of Damascus. I was doing my higher education. I was married to, I lived somewhere in Damascus. Uh, during my, uh, my time in Damascus, I always dreamt of uh, leaving Syria mm. and traveling abroad somewhere where I could you know, be f- more free and uh, have more freedom. Because in our country, people are usually treated not like a human. Yeah. They're treated like anything but a human. And you can't, for example, talk about politics. You can't talk about religion. You, talk, you can't either talk about uh, the economy. Mm. You can't talk basically about anything that's related to the, re- the, the regime. So this was, this was generally amongst the people of Syria at, at the time. Or do you mean in particular like the government and, uh, and the regime? No, no, this was in general. It was mm. a taboo to talk about these subjects. So people didn't feel any comfortable living in Damascus or in Syria in general. Mm. It was, you, know, you, you are always under threat of being taken if, you're, if you talk about any of these topics or if you touch anything that's related to the regime. I felt that I have to move, but I had to finish my study first. And you know, there is in Syria, the military service is obligatory. Yeah. So I had to go to it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to how to run away from it. Subhanallah. So, until yeah, is it before you study you have to uh, enroll depends, in the army no, or after? As long as you're studying, you don't go. You know, okay. you, st- you can keep delaying until there is like a certain age, which was like uh, 26 or t- 27 maybe, which mm-hmm. was my age at that time. Uh, you can't delay on studying. You know, yeah. you have to go to the. It becomes uh, mandatory. You have yeah, to you have to go to the military yeah. service. And of course, military service is not like the military service that, you, that comes to anyone's mind that you're serving the country. Actually, you're serving the officers. You're, so, you're mm. serving the, the, you know, this uh, sectarian regime that's uh, mm, uh, controlling Syria. During this time, you said you're around 27 years old. You, you were studying. Uh, you got to complete your, your studies. Yeah. And by that time, the revolution had, had begun while you yeah. were in union or just after you finished? SubhanAllah, it just started... At the very beginning, when I was about to go to the military service, mm-hmm. and uh, at that moment, I decided to go to Ghouta, where th- it was semi liberated. Yeah. And I wanted to join people who were resisting the regime at that time. I wanted to help them in any means. Mm. So I took my family and ran away to Ghouta. Yeah. Were I there am. many other people, in particular in your university, uh, that chose to leave regime areas at the early days and, and basically join the revolutionists in liberated areas? There were so many who wanted to go, but they didn't know how. Mm. Alhamdulillah, I had some means. I had some friends inside Ghouta who, who told me how to go inside Ghouta because the routes were almost of them. There were checkpoints. They were blocked. Yeah, so sure. you, I had to go through different routes, you know. Yeah. So I took my family. It was dangerous, very dangerous to go th- inside Ghouta. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah because it was, uh, any, uh, there was so much bombing, uh, airstrikes. You know, we've yeah. nev- I had never been... Yani in this kind of situations, my family with me, my wife and my child at that time, I had only one child at that time. Yeah, and you can imagine it's a, it would be a very scary uh, move, especially we, we, we hear so much about Said Naya prison and, uh, and, and the hundreds of thousands of detainees that have been uh, taken there you know, without any trial, without anything. Their whereabouts are unknown. The, the, if they're alive or not, it's unknown. Women, children, uh, men. 
So it must must have been a very frightening experience, you yeah. know. Moving maybe you as an individual might be easy, but as a family, I'm sure it would have been a difficult decision to make. Yeah, it's true. It's, look, prisons in in Syria, then they were full already before the revolution. Mm. You know, and he, uh, as I told you, there are taboos that you can't talk about. So whenever anybody talks about religion, uh, if you practice Islam, you know, in, in let's say in a correct way, okay, mm-hmm. it, it, they don't like it. So the, you, the, you're taken to prison yeah. and you might spend years and years. If you talk about the economy of the country, if you talk about the politics of the country, if you talk mm-hmm. about the regime in general, they might take you to the, to the jail and you might spend years and years or they, you might be killed mm-hmm. inside the prison. Would you say this is the main reason that drove you uh, to join the revolution and to and to? Of course, it's, it's one of the main reasons. Yes, of course, it's the main reason for me and main reason for many people, not only for me, yeah. for all the guys who went in this revolution. So you you moved to Ruta, and Ruta initially at the beginning it wasn't besieged, correct? It was halfly besieged. Uh-huh. We had like two roads open, okay, with checkpoints for the Nizam. Mm-hmm. Yani nothing, not big things would enter. Yep. For example, they would, uh, uh, for example, uh, big amounts of fuel or food wouldn't go inside unless they are smuggled, you know, mm. inside cars, uh, they under the cars. So yeah. it was semi besieged, let's say, you know. Mm-hmm. But like after two years, there was complete besiege. Mm. They blocked all the roads and it became a military area. Yeah. So whoever was inside was, was in there and until the end, basically. Yeah. Yeah, there were 400,000 people inside wow. the Ruta and all of them, they were besieged. You could imagine how it was difficult. Yeah. And it, life became so primitive. There's no, there was no electricity, there was n- no fuel mm. to run cars, to run generators. There was, we didn't have any access to any food supplies, yeah. not even to clear water. So life was very difficult for everybody. You could, yani, after three or four months of the siege started, you could look at people in the street as if they had gone through a very severe diet. They became very skinny mm. and pale. Like, like famine, yeah. yeah. And we heard, uh, being in northern Syria at the time, we would always hear stories of what uh, yourself and what other Syrians were going through in Ruta. Uh, many stories, even I remember there was one story, I mean, kids, they would literally risk their lives to go into no man's land, maybe just to get some fruit or, you know, or some, a, b- a bit of food off a tree. Because as you know, like Ruta, these areas, they're, they're very known yeah. for like orchards, you know. And many times, you know, any, any kids and people, they'll be killed just because they're trying to get some fruit to, to live. Yeah, that's true. I, also, I have some stories of my friends. Some of them, they lost their lives trying to get some plastic. You know, there mm. in Ruta, people would collect plastic because plastic was had a very high price mm. there because they would take it and change it into, they melt it down in a special way, I don't know the way. Mm-hmm. And then they change it into ga- gas, uh, diesel and uh, gasoline. Yeah, yeah. So it, it had very high, high value. value, yes. Wow, so amazing. at the end, yani, uh, Ruta became like free of plastic. You could see no plastic at all. Wow. So the guys had to go between us and between the army, you know, mm-hmm. in places where the army could see you sometimes. So to take like uh, a plastic tank, somewhere, something like that. So I, one of my friends lost his hand. He got a bullet shot here, a sniper shot mm-hmm. in his hand here under the shoulder and it was cut. And other people also died just trying to get some plastic. Yeah. I can't I really I can't imagine what, what what the people went through, you know. And the the front lines there was it mainly regime forces, out of asset forces, or were there other parties involved? No, there were so many other parties. At the beginning, uh, it was only the Syrian army, but uh, as soon as the Syrian army got very weak, mm. because there some of the soldiers started to run away from the army coming inside Ruta and go or other to go to other to other places or other mm. towns to join the revolution the Hezbollah came inside from Lebanon yeah. and they starting uh, started uh, fighting with the Nizam and just also after a few months uh, we uh, we started hearing people coming from Pakistan mm. Shia people uh, coming from Pakistan from other areas also from other countries then you know what happens after that. Is Russia started coming in and helping yes. the regime with airstrikes and kept, and kept escalating. Yeah, because we we used to hear this as well that Iran, uh, Afghanis, Pakistani, Shia. Because Assad basically he's he's trying to push for a sectarian war. Yeah, uh, true. Uh, when really you know more than me at the start of the revolution, it was basically all Syrians that were just calling for freedom, for dignity ag- right. against an oppressive government. So what Assad would do is he would try and focus on. Uh, the minorities 
and try and say that these are terrorists. They're trying to. He'd basically put fear into the hearts of uh, minorities, and he would use this card to try and gather support. And we hear in Damascus a lot of areas now that they're, they're occupied by Iranian uh, Shia yeah, uh, militias, true. like you mentioned, Afghani, Pakistani yeah. uh, militias, and uh, and and really, it's it's sad, you know. Or, or what I'd like to ask you is the main reason why why you believe that Assad really focused on Ghouta. Why do you think? Because there was constantly military campaigns, there was constantly bombing, shelling, and as we'll get to soon, uh, any, any, the biggest chemical weapon attack in Syria happened in, in the town of Ghouta. Uh, why do you think there was so much focus from the regime on, on this area? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, this Damascus, you know, is the heart of Syria. Mm. And uh, it uh, really threatened the regime if uh, it was taken the regime would fall right away. Yeah, you have the so, capital city, not far yeah, from the capital. It's the yeah. capital city. So they had, yeah, we were like just two kilometers away from the heart of Damascus. Mm. So if they, yani, if they couldn't get uh, rid of the re- rebels inside the Ghouta, it would have been a big problem for them. In terms of the chemical weapons, uh, because we saw in uh, 2013, this was, uh, as far as I know, this was the first, maybe there was, there was times before this, but the biggest chemical attack on civilians in Syria was in 2013 That's uh, true. in Ghouta. That's true. This chemical attack was the biggest one, and subhanAllah, I was in the area where it, uh, we received this uh, chemical attack first. I was in Zamalka city, and I can remember it was a very awful day. Uh, it was two o'clock in the morning, I was sleeping, and it was very quiet at the beginning. Suddenly I heard someone running in the alley, and he was shouting, and I could hear that he couldn't breathe very well. He was mm. shouting that there was a chemical attack. Until that moment, I was waking up and I couldn't comprehend what he was saying exactly. I couldn't comprehend mm. what was going on. Just a few seconds later, I felt that I was out of breath. And my wife next to me woke up and she had the same symptoms. She couldn't breathe well. So yeah. I understood that there was a real chemical attack. Serious. It wasn't, it wasn't like a normal bombing where, where it's just a bombing and then uh, yeah. things settle down. It yes. seemed like there was more to it. So what happened that I I asked her just to run away upstairs to the roof. Hmm. She didn't know why, you know, but uh, suddenly they started throwing more missiles. These are chemical missiles. Hmm. So I told her to go upstairs right away and I carried my son there upstairs to the roof. So she sh- started shouting at me to go downstairs because this is what usually happens yeah, when yeah, there's yeah. a bomb, you go downstairs. You used to go to the basement, you know? yes. But I shouted her and told her, look, this is a chemical attack and we have to go upstairs. Yeah, yeah. And because sarin gas, it, uh, it's, it, it sinks it's basically. Heavy. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. This is the first yeah. measurement that we were told if we were to you know, hit by a chemical attack, you just go upstairs mm-hmm. because the gas usually goes down. Yeah. It's true to some extent, because when we went upstairs, just after five minutes, I felt that I'm going to faint. Mm. I couldn't breathe well. My, my uh, two children also couldn't breathe well. I had a very small child, like one year old at that time. I, I tried to put a mask for him, but he couldn't take it, you know. Mm, he he doesn't young, know how yeah, to, yeah. to deal with it. So uh, I decided to leave that to leave the neighborhood. I, I had a car at that time. It was destroyed later by an airstrike. So I took my family and some of my friends in my car. We went uh, north to a town, like seven kilometers away from Zamalka city. Mm -hmm. We stayed there for 11 hours. I couldn't breathe well at that time. I had very strange symptoms. My uh, pupil was very, very small. All the people who were around me had small pupils. Uh, We had problem breathing. Uh, Our bodies were very weak. Mm-hmm. Did you go to the hospital or you went to just a further area to try and get away from... The first uh, thing I went to, the f- uh, yes, uh, to a far area, yeah. okay, just to get rid of the gas that was around us. I went to a clinic there, mm-hmm. but the, the clinic was full of people and symptoms like the, the one that I had were like mild symptoms, you know. Mm. So they didn't receive me. Usually they give you an injection yeah. that helped you to breathe better. Okay. So I didn't take that injection. I just went back to my friend's house. Subhanallah, the symptoms that we had, as, to, as I told you, they were very mild. But uh, when I came back home after mm. like 12 or 13 hours, it was a disaster. The next alley in the next neighborhood where I used to live, people, all the families were dead. Some, oh. some of them, they were dead in bed, some were dead out in the street uh, trying to get help. Some of the, actually, the, some of the medics also were in the street dead. Mm. They were trying to help other people. Uh, 
Uh, some families were dead and they w- we couldn't find them after maybe three days or four days because they, they didn't know how to react. So they went inside the bathroom storage. They closed the doors just to let the gas outside. Okay, mm-hmm. But, you know, Sarin went inside and killed all the families. Oh. Some very sad stories. I have one of my friends. He was uh, newly married. He died with his wife and his mother-in-law in the same house, just very close to my house. Subhanallah. Yeah. Subhanallah. I think... Uh, and yeah, this is a horrific experience, and, and, and it's a shame in this day and age that this, this actually happened, you know, and continues to happen. Uh, as far as I know, the UN, they confirmed, I think, 1,300 killed, you know, men, women, and children. And, and as far as I know, like four or 500 of them were children. And this is, this is only what was confirmed by the UN. I've, I've heard many reports from locals on the ground that it, it's much higher than that. I, th- I think it was much, much b- bigger number. Uh, and people say, medics w- would say that there were about 2,000 people who died at that time. And really, you could see the hospitals, the clinics, clinics well, they're, yeah. they're, they were full of people, of children, of women, of different ages, dead. They were dead, choked, they couldn't breathe. For, for our, our, the people listening with us today, uh, sarin gas, it's a nerve agent. So it's basically, it's, it's colorless, it's odorless, has no flavor. And you mentioned the, how it sinks, and it, because it's heavier than air, basically it, it, it sinks to the ground straight away. And what it actually does, as far as I know, is it it causes your your muscles to just to to, to relax, basically. That's right. Uh, and then it starts putting pressure on your lungs, on your heart, and then next thing you know, you, you're suffocating. And these happens can happen uh, instantly if you're very close to the the vapors. Can happen uh, instantly. And the scene that you're describing now, you know, people. Newlyweds, they, they, they didn't know where to go. They went to the bathroom. They were found dead in the bathroom. First aid responders on the streets. It shows, and we've seen videos of this. We've seen images of this, and, and many uh, witnesses. It's horrific, really. It's horrific. Yeah. So, uh, we had some also some strange stories that happened that many people were considered to be dead between the deaths, you know. But subhanAllah, this sarin gas, it has a way that it stops the heart, you know. Mm. But after a few, like, two hours, maybe it's very the heart is beating, but very faintly that the doctors thought that the person was dead. Mm-hmm. So they said that some uh, people were buried alive, you know. Super I'm not sure of the story, but this is what some people said. Because Super we heard, we saw, I saw some people who were between the dead people who mm-hmm. were ready to go, you know, to be buried in the, in the graveyards. But somehow they mo- made a movement and some people realized that they were moving and they picked them up between, from among the dead people. Assad and his regime, they would argue that they're targeting terrorists, quote unquote terrorists. They'll say that they're hitting military targets, military bases. Why do you think Assad you know, resorted to using chemical weapons? And, and is this true in your opinion? Yeah, as I told you, from the very beginning, uh, Assad regime started to be very weak. Mm-hmm. They tried to get help from uh, Shia uh, groups and militias from Lebanon, from Pakistan, from other countries. But it was useless. Even though the, the, the fighters who were fighting the, the regime, uh, they didn't have that big experience in fighting. But because they had, you know, they have Qadiyya, you know, they have... Uh, yeah, it's, you're you defending. Know. Yeah, and when you, you mentioned, and I'm sorry to cut you off because really it touches my heart. You, you, you're, you're there, I can only imagine you're there with your, your wife, your children, your relatives, and you're besieged. And you've got all these fighters and constant airstrikes attacking you on a daily basis. It's natural that you're going to defend yourself. That's true. It's the main thing to do is, is to defend yourself and to defend the women and children behind you. That's true. And, and we've heard many stories, especially of uh, in, uh, Joba, you know, was, was renowned. You know, how yeah. the locals there, how they fought. And, and the regime wasn't even able to, to take One any building. part of Joba. You yeah. know, it wasn't until the end where, where the areas collapsed and it fell militarily. So it showed that the, the people that really they were fighting to protect That's their right. honor, to protect the women, their children and their lives. So we had a cause to defend. Mm. And at the same time, the feeling that we had after moving from the authority of the regime to a, the, to a different authority of Allah, Azza wa Jal, mm. it was like, even though we were bombed with airstrikes, with TNT barrels, with all these types of weapons that we never thought that we would be bombarded with, sure. we, felt, we felt happy, you know, mm. we felt free. So we wanted to defend that feeling, you know, we wanted to to have our freedom. So it's, 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 it's really a touching thing. And that, that's what's, what it's about, you know, you know, fighting for the freedom. Of not, not just yourselves, you know, for, for your children, you know, for the future generation. You, know, you, you grow up, experience something, and no parent would want their, their child to grow up under a regime, tyrant regime, be oppressed. It's a very noble cause. Yeah. Why, why do you think, though, Assad chose to, use, or chose to use 
chemical weapons because the 2013 attacks in Ruta that killed almost, you know, like reports were saying up to 2,000 people, was, was, it seems like it was a message from Assad to those that uh, stood up against him. Why do you think he used chemical weapons or such extreme measures? Yeah, they used it. They wanted to take Ruta on that day. Hmm. They were planning to take Ruta. And they thought by throwing this kind of chemical weapons and killing like mass, massive numbers of people, mm. we would be weak. And this is exactly what happened after they bombed us, bomb, when they bombed us with the chemical uh, weapons. After three hours, they started massive, big, huge uh, military offense on Jobar and Zamalka mm-hmm. and Ain Terma. These are three uh, big frontiers. But subhanAllah, they were, yani, they were not successful and uh, many tanks of the regime were hit and they le- some of the soldier- soldiers also left the tanks uh, working. They ran away. Uh, hundreds of soldiers kill- were killed at that time. So the, basically, they wanted to take Ruta. They wanted mm. to finish you know, this issue. Yeah, it, it, it seems like it was an act of desperation. You know, if they were aiming to take Ruta and they, they went to these extreme measures, you know, to strike fear into the, the hearts of the people and to, to, to kill innocent men, women and children, and then begin their military offensive and they failed. Really, really shows that they were in a state of desperation at that time. That's true. Yes. I think there's another thing that, uh, that seems apparent is that Assad, this isn't the first time that Assad's used chemical weapons or gone to extreme measures. Uh, in his fight and you mentioned that his main it seems like his main motive was to cause mass fear mass panic uh, mass casualties amongst the the Syrian people and then try to take back land but it seems that there's no real accountability or backlash uh, whenever Assad goes to these extreme measures and and then maybe that led to him using it again in the future Look, brother, uh, the main one, as I told you, was this uh, sarin gas when it was used in Zemelka and Ain Terma, where 2,000 people died. But the regime continued using chemical weapons more like, uh, I think, more than like 100 times or 200 times. Yeah, according to one study, uh, there was 336 attacks, chemical weapon attacks, and yeah. 98% of them from Assad, the other 2% being uh, ISIS. Yeah, that's, in, in Ruta, we had only, we didn't have ISIS inside Ruta. Ruta. Yeah. So it was all coming from uh, Assad regime. regime. And they used different types of gases, but the worst one was sarin. They used chlorine gases too, yeah. too much actually. Uh, they use it on a daily basis when there is a, 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 like a military offensive. Mm, mm. Of course, there was no accountability. And this is what we were shocked by, how the international world is not reacting to this kind of attacks. And not only that, Yanni, even the reaction that they gave and they showed wasn't up to the level, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. B- because Yanni, killing 2,000 people in one day, this is uh, Yanni, horrible. Mm. It's a horrible thing. Mm. Uh, the other thing that uh, Yanni, shocked us also is that uh, Yanni, they only talked about the chemical attack. They didn't talk about other things. You know, mm. there were about like twenty people death toll every day mm. by different types of uh, weapons. Mm. What about these people? Is mm-hmm. it permissible to kill people with TNT barrels? Is it permissible to kill people with air strikes? So we don't understand how the international world acts. How yeah, yeah. No, no. You're right, Aki. And and even the the reaction you mentioned before, the reaction of uh, any certain world world powers. Uh, really, it wasn't proportionate with the, with the attacks, and yeah. it seems, at least in my opinion, it seems a bit hypocritical. That's true. Because, okay, for example, the last uh, or the second major chemical attack weapons happened in 2017, I think, in Khan Shikhun. Uh Also, was sarin uh, gas attack, and yes, America they they fired some missiles, they hit some air bases, but really, no real accountability, no real change, no real backlash happened. And it seems like the world powers are just doing it to sort of uh, because they're forced to react to it or show yeah. some type of reaction yes. to it. Uh, but really, the, the the people on the ground, they're still dying. They're still suffering. And the fact that it's happened hundreds of times uh, just shows that that really Assad, he doesn't care about uh, about these things. And and even the last elections, you know, yeah. he held his elections inside Duma. That's true. And uh, for the rest of the world, that might seem insignificant. But for the Syrian people, this was the place. Actually, people here on the ground, I'm talking about Syrian rebels and uh, civilians, they actually know what's happening and they understand how the international is 
acting and why they are, are, are why they are acting like that. Mm-hmm. You, you had a story before that uh, you wanted to share with me. Subhanallah, yes. One day, there's like a highway between us and between the regime. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, subhanallah, I want to cry. And subhanallah, really, what, what, what happened there, it's not easy, you know. And subhanallah, someone living there and, and seeing everything with their eyes, you know, it's not like hearing about it. Hundreds and, and, and thousands of Muslims, you know, they, they went through this. Any civilians, innocent civilians. And really the whole world uh, stayed silent. And, uh, and, and really there's, there's not much excuse for, for the world. And that's why it's very important that, especially from the ground, you know, and, and people that saw things and, and witnessed what was happening, uh, that they share and they, they tell everyone what was happening. And even I've seen many cases of this, you know, you go to like just after an airstrike or, or you'll be near a hit and you see people pulling out their phones, recordings and this. From your emotions, you get upset. You're like, why, why is everyone recording for? You know, people are dying. But then you're stuck in the middle because if, if you don't show people what's happening and you don't tell them what's happening, then things will just continue as they are and people keep getting killed silently. Yeah. So uh, one day, there's, as I told there's a highway between us and between the regime. Mm. Like it was the, the frontier and uh, we had Ribat over there, the guys who had Ribat on the frontier there. Mm. So the regime suddenly sent a woman, she was naked, and uh, they sent her to cut this, the highway to come to our area, you know, to the liberated area. Mm. The guys were looking at her and they were shocked how this woman is going, coming in. There are snipers, you know. Suddenly they hit her, hit her. The regime hit the, that woman they with shot, the sniper. They her. Yeah, they shot mm. her in the in the in her leg or somewhere, and she actually passed away. Uh, the guys tried to reach out to her at the beginning with ropes, with uh, metals, just to grab her, but it mm. was very difficult. So they decided to send one of the brother there, and uh, he ran very quick to her, uh, but he received another bullet also, and he died just next to her. Wow. Then another, there another brother also ran to to take her, just to cover her body, but also he got killed. Then they sent a brother with uh, with a rope. They tied the rope around his waist, and he ran also over there. He could grab her, and also I remember that he died. He told the brothers told that he died, but they could uh, and he drug the woman inside our area, and they buried her. Uh, it so turned that she was one of the sisters who was imprisoned, and they wanted to humiliate us with with her by sending her naked to our areas. And he, and he, and he really this is horrific, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and nobody hears about these things. The, the world needs to know that this tyrant, this oppressor, this is who we're fighting. These, these are his soldiers who, who do these type of things. Yeah. You know, they're humiliating the people. They, they're killing innocent people. True. And really, people here, they're fighting for their freedom, they're fighting for dignity, they're fighting for honor. Really, it's a shame, you know, that As- Assad and Russia, that this mass disinformation campaign that, that it's, it's mainly backed by Russia. They're trying to say that, you know, these chemical weapons never happened. It's it's fake news that they, they hit warehouses that belong to terrorists. True. And even those times they even said that the terrorists bombed themselves yeah, with chemical true. weapons. And for the, for the people on the ground, we look at it like a big joke. It's so much of a joke, we don't even think twice about it. But, but really on the outside, people are becoming confused. And really it's a big insult, you know. To the shuhada, to the people that to protect like the, the lives and the honor of innocent people, the hypocrisy of these countries really, really, it's not on. You mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not just these, it's not just about you know chemical weapon attacks. Yeah. You know, there, there's been hundreds of thousands. You know, in a statistic state, up to a million people murdered and killed in the most brutal way, and no one's doing anything. In my opinion, this is the real crime. Yeah. yeah and he, uh, okay, sarin was used. Okay, chlor was used. Uh, you know, you know, mustard gas. Okay, these things were used, but daily. You know, the Syrian people have seen hundreds, thousands of, of their, their relatives, of, of their women, of their children, of their, their sisters, uh, being killed and be, and being humiliated. And this is the real tragedy. I think. Brother, uh, during this uh, revolution, the regime killed about 1.5 million people and displaced more than four, four, 14 million other million people inside and outside Syria. And this is not new because the, this regime, they also they did the same thing in 1982. They killed more than 40,000 people in Hama. Yeah. There was an uprising at that year yeah. and they killed them only in seven days. So this, this regime has been like that not 
recently, but for a very long time. Mm-hmm. So some would say now that you know Assad has quote unquote liberated uh, many territories of Idlib from the you know, revolutions yeah. of them being Ghouta. But what's the real situation in Ghouta right now? Yes, we see on the map that it, that it's it's been taken. So we're we're hearing constantly in uh, in Ghouta, you know, if not daily, weekly. There are assassinations on on key figures, uh, military uh, personnel. Just during the last uh, election or so-called election campaign by Assad, there were brave people in Dara that actually came out. They were protesting. So has Assad actually won anything now that he's taking these areas? Now, it's true that Assad has taken these uh, areas and it's not in the grip of the rebels anymore, but uh, the situation is not uh, very clear on media. Mm. They, they say that it's settled down for the regime in, the, in these areas, for example, in Ghouta, in uh, Homs, Hama, and different parts of uh, Syria, especially Dara. Mm. But the situation is different. Every now and then, as you said, there are, there are assassinations of big officers, mm. Uh, soldiers are very afraid to go inside Ghouta. Uh, every now and then you hear that there is a checkpoint that has been attacked by rebels who were left behind. Yeah, yeah So uh, it's not settled anymore. And uh, even people who are inside, they're, they're fed up with this regime. They thought that maybe uh, the people who were left behind there, they, f- they th- thought at the beginning that m- they might have a better lifestyle when the regime comes back after the uh, they break the the siege but uh, it turned to be so much different mm. now they're regretting the days of the uh, of the besiege uh, and uh, they so want uh, the, you know the, the the rebels to come back to their areas but unfortunately it's not uh, happening now subhanallah and I, and i think what you're saying speaks volumes you know that yeah at the end of the day it doesn't matter what world powers think how they react or how they don't react. What matters is that the Syrian people themselves, they, they won't forget. That's right. And at the end of the day, and yourself and, and the hundreds of thousands that were forcefully displaced all over uh, Syria and all over the world, at the end of the day, they want to go back home in That's freedom, right. in peace, That's with right. dignity, with honor. And they'll never forget this. That's true. Right. Actually, we are still working. And here in Idlib, uh, people, displaced people, and even the people of Idlib, of Idlib, they are helping us, and we are working together, inshallah, to go back to Ghouta, to Dara, to Homs, to Hamad, to all these cities that uh, were with us before. And inshallah, we'll get rid of this regime very soon, inshallah. Inshallah. It was very good to speak to you, Ali. And, uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and really, the story really touched me, Ali. Yeah, 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 that's the true. rest of my life, Akhi. And, and thank you very much for coming in today and God sharing Allah. your experience thank and you spending much. time with us. Uh, really, it's really appreciated. Jazakallah khair. Hey, khair. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.